Hi everyone, this is Shilam Sujan, a final year medical student in GMC Siddhpe. Today we are going to start the learning section in our channel. Let us start learning with multinodular goiter. Before going into multinodular goiter, let us know that goiter means the diffuse enlargement of thyroid gland. For the classification of goiter, we have simple goiter, toxic goiter, neoplastic goiter, thyroiditis and other part of classification which can be under miscellaneous. So we know that goiter means diffuse enlargement of thyroid gland. When the enlargement of thyroid gland does not secrete any increased hormone production then it is just simple goiter. In simple goiter we have puberty goiter, pregnancy goiter, iodine induced deficiency goiter and multinodular goiter. In all these types of goiters Thyroid hormone production is not at all increased. That's why we placed them in simple goiter. Let us now see what is toxic goiter. Toxic goiter includes Graves disease and toxic multinodular goiter. Graves disease is the most common cause of hyperthyroidism uh, or thyrotoxicosis and second common is toxic multinodular goiter. What does this mean? When simple goiter did not produce any excess amount of thyroid hormones, toxic goiter produces excess amount of thyroid secretions. So in this, thyroid excess will be there in the circulation. That's why it is toxic. When this multinodular goiter, which was not producing excess thyroid hormones, which turns to produce thyroid hormones, then it becomes toxic multinodular goiter. Coming to third class, which is neoplastic goiter. This is the diffuse enlargement of goiter, which is either benign or malignant. Benign can be papillary carcinoma thyroid, follicular carcinoma or medullary carcinoma thyroid. These are originated in the thyroid as the primary source. But the renal cell carcinoma, breast carcinoma and malignant melanoma can send their secondaries to thyroid and then they can start the metastasis in the thyroid gland that is secondary neoplastic goitus. Fourth class is thyroiditis. We know the most uh, uh, common thyroiditis we know is Hashimoto's thyroiditis which is autoimmune. And other can be bacterial thyroiditis, abscess of thyroid, amyloid and cyst. So this is classification of goiter. Let us now look at the most common form of goiter which is multinodular goiter. So, multinodular goiter means the end stage result of diffuse hyperplastic goiter. Let us uh, dive into the depth of multinodular goiter. Let us now understand the etiopathogenesis of multinodular goiter. So, puberty is a cause, pregnancy can also be the cause, iodine deficiency can be the cause. Genetics. In genetics, we, we can see this hormogenesis where there is deficiency of peroxidase or dehalogenase enzyme. These peroxidase or dehalogenase enzymes, these are important for the production of thyroid hormones. So when there is genetic defect, where there is dishormogenesis uh, in this regard, there will be low T3 and T4 hormones, obviously. Goitrogens can also be the cause. In puberty and pregnancy, the metabolic demands in the body are high. But the, uh, the demands are high, but the thyroid secretions from the gland are normal only. For, to reach the demands, the TSH levels will be increased in the body. Let us see how. There is low T3 and T4 levels. Here, a girl can be having the same T3 and T4 levels as another girl, but when she reached puberty, because of the increased metabolic demand, the comparative values on the, in the circulation are low. Also in the pregnancy, the same applies. In iodine deficiency, 
See, we, uh, when we remember physiology, that the thyroid hormone synthesis requires the organic binding of iodine to tyrosine. When there is deficiency of iodine, if any everything is perfect in the body, also there is no source for uh, there is no organic binding iodine, so there will be no synthesis of thyroid hormone, so there will be low T3 and T4 levels in the body. Goitrogens, goitrogens can be cabbage which is food and drugs drugs can be antiarrhythmic drugs like amiodarone or sulfonamides also so these are the goitrogens which also cause low T3 and T4 levels in the body because of these low T3 and T4 levels the feedback mechanism occurs and high TSH will be there. This high TSH will act on the thyroid gland and causes multiple features we will see in our stages. So there are three stages which occur in thyroid gland when there is high TSH activity on the gland. Let us now look at the stages which occur in thyroid gland after the high TSH acting on the gland. So the increased thyroid stimulating hormone acting on the gland causes hyperplasia and hypertrophy of the thyroid gland. This is first stage or also called as diffuse hyperplasia stage. And then the continuous stimulation, the over stimulation of TSH on the gland makes these hyperplasia or hypertrophy cells into active follicles. Now these active follicles will secrete minimal amount of thyroid hormone because these active follicles resemble those of the native follicles of thyroid gland. These follicles eventually undergo necrosis. The necrosis becomes the necrosis which result in the nodule. So the follicle is now the nodule because of necrosis. Many such necrosed nodules will make multinodular goiter. So to understand the meaning of multinodular goiter, we have uh, understood this much of pathogenesis because multinodular goiter. Goiter is diffuse enlargement of thyroid gland. Multinodular, nodule means the necrosed follicle which is formed due to the overstimulation of thyroid gland is nodule and there are so many such necrosed nodules that's why multinodular goiter and these stages we see as first stage can be called as stage of diffuse hyperplasia second stage can be called as stage of mixed goiter because there will be some uh, active follicles and some nodules some uh, not, uh, follicles will be converted into nodules slowly so this can be called as mixed nodules or the stage of active follicles and third is the stage of necrosed follicles or nodular phase so the pathogenesis runs in these three stages let us now look at the clinical features let us remember it with the patient presentation so it will be easier for us to remember a 25 year old female came with the chief complaints of swelling in the neck region with the dys dyspnea and dysphagia. So the most common, uh, it's, it's more common in females with the most common group of age is 20 to 40 years and dyspnea and dysphagia are because of the pressure symptoms uh, due to the enlargement of the thyroid gland on the surrounding tissues. And uh, on examination, if the thyroid swelling is hard, it means that it has undergone calcification. Calcification means it is into malignancy. And if it is soft, it is in the stage of necrosis only. And when hemorrhage occurs in the tissue, the patient can come with sudden increase in size with pain. And the most common site of uh, this nodule formation or the uh, of nodule formation is the junction between isthmus and one lobe of thyroid. Let us now look at management. Management includes investigations and treatment. Here let us understand what are the investigations. Investigations will be complete blood picture 
it can also necessitize CD, uh, ECG and 2D echo in some cases, but they are routine investigations only. X-ray neck is mandatory because we have we should understand the compression of trachea. If, if even if we are going for surgery and for the anesthetist, the compression of trachea is important for intubation. And to rule out retrosternal extension of the growth of the tissue. And to know whether there is any calcification. In long standing multinodular goiters or in the multinodular goiters which are uh, which have turned into malignant, we will see calcification. Flexible laryngoscopy is done to know the vocal cord mobility. Flexible laryngoscopy has replaced indirect laryngoscopy now. USG is very very important. It is the first investigation we do after routine investigations. Uh, and under USG reporting, we have five stages of thyroid imaging reporting and data system. We have five classes. And FNSE, fine needle aspiration cytology, uh, is, is done only for the suspected malignant cases. If the, uh, in clinical features, we have seen that on palpation, if the nodule is hard, we can suspect a malignancy. Uh, also, we can suspect calcification. Uh, see that because hardness is due to calcification, and calcified hard nodule is present in malignant tissues. So, to rule out carcinomas, to rule out malignancy, we'll take FNSE, but it is done only in suspicious cases. And CT is advised to know the retrosternal extension of the tissue. Now, let us start learning about treatment. Treatment includes for multinodular goiter, if the patient is in the early case or the patient is asymptomatic, then we can put the patient under observation or based on the condition of the patient, we can start eltroxin or levothyroxine 0.1 mg per day. So the significance of using this drug which is basically thyroid hormone we are giving from outside. So in, uh, in the pathophysiology we have seen that because of puberty, pregnancy, the metabolic demands are high and in iodine deficiency there is no iodine only to produce thyroid hormone and due to goitrogens there is no production of thyroid hormones. So there is no production of thyroid hormones and the feedback cost increased. Now when we are giving this Eltroxin or levothyroxin, the thyroid hormone we are supplementing from outside. So, when we are giving from outside, the low levels of thyroid hormones is corrected and circulating thyroid hormones level will increase. When circulating thyroid hormones is increased, it will uh, give feedback so that less TSH is produced now. In all the pathophysiology, we have seen it was because of increased TSH but no thyroid hormones. Now we are giving thyroid hormones so that TSH will be decreased. Now less, less TSH, so less action on thyroid, less disease. So that's why we are giving this uh, eltroxin. But still, if there is no improvement or increased growth, then you'll go for surgery. If multinodular goiter is presented with pressure symptoms like we have seen dysphagia and dys dyspnea, or cosmetic complaints are there, or fear of malignancy is there, then also you can go for surgery. If there is retrosternal extension, how did we find there was retrosternal extension in investigations? With CT scan, yes. So with CT scan, we have understood that there is retrosternal extension and we will go for surgery. Surgery is, uh, is very commonly done. In total thyroidectomy, all the thyroid tissue and parathyroid tissue is removed without sparing any tissue of thyroid in the place. But that requires very much expertise of the surgeon to spare recurrent laryngeal nerve very well and remove total uh, complete thyroid tissue without leaving any tissue in the place. So this is the treatment of choice but requires expertise. And this is done nowadays. So total thyroidectomy is done nowadays. Earlier we also used to do subtotal thyroidectomy. But 
that spares uh, some tissue in subtotal thyroidectomy we remove most of the thyroid tissue but we spare some tissue for the production of recurrent laryngeal nerve and parathyroid gland so because of subtotal thyroidectomy uh, we have advantage of protection of recurrent laryngeal nerve and parathyroid gland and the same are reverse here to, by, because of total thyroidectomy we can have risk for recurrent laryngeal nerve and permanent hypoparathyroidism for the patient Dunhill procedure is done when one lobe has severe number of nodules and other, other lobe has very few nodules so total lobectomy is done for, the, for this lobe and subtotal lobectomy is done for the lobe which has very few nodules so that the thyroid uh, gland will be there parathyroid gland will be there and recurrent laryngeal nerve injury is spared so these are the surgery options we have available for management of multinodular goiter so i have a question for you thyroid scoring is based on which investigation please comment down thanks for watching hit the like and subscribe button that gives motivation for me to do more videos like this also share to your friends thank you